What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to American Made Boating. My name is Chris Albert. I'm your host, and I'm also the director of sales and marketing for Fortress Marine Anchors. We've been making the world's best anchor for over 32 years, right here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Every part of our anchors is made right here in the USA, and our FX model anchors come with a hassle-free lifetime parts replacement warranty. That means if any part of that anchor breaks or bends, we cover the cost free of charge minus the cost of shipping. So when you're buying one of our anchors, you're really buying a lifetime relationship with us and it is our honor to serve you. Today, I have an absolutely awesome episode for you. I'm speaking to Mr. Ken Clinton of Intrepid Power Boats. Ken is what you call a true innovator in the American boating industry. When you buy an Intrepid Power Boat, your boat is going to be different than any other Intrepid Power Boat that ever came off the line. They take customization to the extreme. And these things are absolutely gorgeous. When you see an Intrepid out there on the water, you can't mistake it for anything else. They've got an interesting profile. They're, they're, they're absolutely beautiful. And they perform like no other. So I wanted to bring Ken on here to talk about Intrepid's story, to talk about the innovations that he's currently bringing to market, and to talk about what the future looks like for Intrepid and what the future of American boating looks like through his eyes. So without further delay, let's get into this interview with Mr. Ken Clinton of Intrepid Power Boats on American Made Boating. Welcome to American Made Boating, brought to you by Fortress Marine Anchors. Each week, we're bringing you the best boating knowledge, insights, and stories from some of the most amazing people in the American boating industry. Set your anchor turn up your speakers and get ready for an awesome show mr ken clinton welcome to american made boating how are you doing today sir good chris it's good to be here awesome awesome so we're both from the great state of connecticut and uh you know, I was reading that about you. What was it like for you growing up in Connecticut and, and how'd you end up down here in Florida? Well, it's a little town where I was raised. It was uh, Danielson, Connecticut, which was kind of over by the Rhode Island line on the East Coast. And I got married very young. And on our honeymoon, we went to Florida to go to Bush Gardens. So we left Providence, Rhode Island airport in February with about eight inches of snow on the ground. And we landed in sunny Tampa and got off the plane and realized that there was green grass and leaves on the trees in February down here in Florida. Yeah. So we spent a week on our honeymoon down here. And then on the plane ride back, you know, I looked at my wife at the time and said, look, why do I have to wait till I'm too old to enjoy this weather? Uh, why, why don't we just move, you know, and you know, the, at a, when you're 19 years old, you're, there's no fear. So, you know, we went back and we packed up all our stuff and off to Florida, we went. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very similar story on my end. I, uh, I was in the Marine Corps and I was an Arctic cold weather specialist and wow. I, I was freezing, freezing, freezing cold. And I'd grown up with all these cold winters. When I got out, I was like, I'm never going to be cold again. So I moved to California <laughs> first, then I moved here. <laughs> nice. Um, so you got your start working on submarines, right? That's big up there in Connecticut. And, um, yeah. and, and then you were working at Triumph Yachts in, Ta- in Tampa afterwards. What did you take from those experiences when you started working with Intrepid? Well, it was funny because when I worked up in Connecticut, being a small town where we were, you really had to travel to make any money. And my father had worked at General Dynamics and Groton building subs for over 30 years. So it was like one of those things where, you know, your father did it and now you go do it. And I was a first class outside machinist. And, you know, I think it brought a lot of structure. Um, I think it was very disciplined doing work for the government. And when we moved to Florida, because I was a machinist and I had been to school for CNC programming, I figured that's what I would do down here. So in the beginning, I was applying everywhere as a CNC machinist. And then the, the funny part about it was when we were down here on the honeymoon, I would ask everybody, you know, what the, what's the cost of living down here? What are the wages like? 
And everybody said, you know, you pay for the sun tax and, and uh, so you make a little bit less money. So I figured back then, and we're talking 31 years ago, I was making probably $13, $14 an hour, which was a lot of money back then. Yep. And I moved to Florida and I said, ah, I'll probably make $10 an hour. Don't worry about it. Well, I applied everywhere when I first got down here as a CNC programmer machinist. And I think the best job offer I had was like $6 an hour. I remember going home to my wife at one point and saying, wow, we really screwed up and I, we're in trouble. <laughs> and so then I went to this place over in Tampa and they were, uh, Triumph Yachts was the name of it. They were a Genmark company at the time. And I went in for the interview and the, and the guy I'll never forget, his name was Henry. And he looked across the desk and he said, son, how do I know that you can build boats? And I said, you know what? I build submarines. I'll do everything opposite and it'll float instead of sink. <laughs> and the guy said, you know what? I really like you, kid. I'm going to give you a shot. You know, so I, I went into that and, and the, where they put me was installing inboard engines. I was an MEP guy. So I did 454 Mercury's, uh, Crusaders. There was remote V drives. They were all inboard stuff. So, you know, we were doing uh, shaft logs and rudder ports and, and all that stuff. And, and within a month, I, I just really had a knack for it. They called me in the office and they said, look, we would like to put you in charge of our MAP department. You know, would you be interested in it? I said, yeah, if you're asking me if I can teach people how to line metal up in a straight line, sure. You know, and, and that's kind of how my management, uh, I guess, career in the boating industry started. That's awesome. That's awesome. That must have been such a great experience to have that at such a young age. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it was also a challenge because, you know, I was there for about a year and the luxury tax went through, which mm -hmm. destroyed our industry. So being a Genmark company, what it what they did is they they basically shrunk everything down and and they moved the Triumph project. They closed it down. They kept just a handful of us managers and they moved us to Sarasota to the Wellcraft facility. So we went to Wellcraft. I was down there for a few months and uh, got let go from there. Just the industry was just, you know, terrible at the time. So a, a company moved in, which was Super Hawaii Intrepid, which was owned by a Japanese gentleman at the time. And during this consolidation, Viking Yachts did the same thing. And Viking had a facility here in St. Petersburg, Florida, and they closed it and they moved it up to New Jersey. So there was this large, empty facility that was here with a bunch of skilled labor around it that built boats. So um, when they moved in, I applied and I kind of lowballed my way in to get in there and, and started off as a boat builder there. The, the hard part was is my career, once again, started taking off pretty quick. And when you're that young and you're starting to manage uh, people that have been in the industry for a while – it's tough. You know, yeah. I think by the time I was 25, I was a plant manager of intrepid power boats, oh, wow. you know, and, and I'm, I'm managing guys that, you know, they would tell me, you know, you were crapping your diapers when I was building boats, you know, and, <laughs> and, but I had to earn their respect. You know, I had to earn their respect and show them that I had a skill set that, uh, was worth following as a leader. And, uh, it, it worked out. So important. That's so important. And I had, um, I had Pat Healy from Viking on here uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was saying the same thing about the luxury tax. It was kind of like a, a death knell for the industry for a bit. Yeah, it was scary. You know, it was one of those things where, you know, it reminds you that what you do for a living, nobody needs, you know, nobody needs a boat. Right. So, you know, it's one of those things where you, it has driven me to be the best that I can be. Because if you're going to build something that nobody needs to ensure your success of the company, you better be the best at it in the industry. Yeah. And, you know, you guys are known for your innovations, right? So, so every boat you build is different from another one, but you're also innovative in your business model. You don't have a dealer network. You don't have stock boats. You don't keep a showroom or anything like that. And I, I imagine that's probably been very helpful during these times with COVID-19 and everything. But, but how did you come about uh, bringing, a, bringing out that business model? What, what made you do that? Well, it's one of those things where we wanted to put a lot more man hours into our boats because we break a lot of rules. We break a lot of rules in how we build it. 
And the penalty for that is you, you have to put in a lot of extra man hours. You use expensive materials. And if we had a dealership network as well, where they need to be able to make their margin on top of what we have to do, we'd be priced out of the market. So we kind of painted ourselves in a corner in a sense that, you know, if we wanted to build these, these boats uh, the way that we felt that they should be built, then we're going to have to figure out a business model that we can still be profitable. And, and we, in the beginning, it was more along the lines of not being able to afford to have a, a, a dealership network that turned into something that was more of a relationship with our customers. What's great about the business model, the way we have it, is most manufacturers don't even know who their end user is until they get a warranty card in the mail saying that John Smith bought one of their boats. Yeah. With us, we sit across the table from our customers and we we know who they are. We know their wives, their kids, what they do for a living. We we sit down and do design sessions with them and we tailor this build to how they use the boat. And it's those relationships that really not only uh, does it does it build a loyalty base to our brand, but it's one of those things where they help engineer our boats. They're the ones that when you sit across and you hear directly from the customer how they use the boat and what's important to them, and then you go into your next design session for your next boat, those are the things that I replay in my head over and over again to ensure that we're, we continue to evolve and continue to bring out new innovative ideas. Yeah, you guys say the customers create what you guys build, and that's literally what happens. Can can you take me through that process when somebody is looking to get an Intrepid powerboat? How do they start, and and what's that process like till till they uh, get the boat delivered? Sure, we have a sales office. That's our sales office. That's in Dania, which is over by the Fort Lauderdale Airport at the Harbor Town Marina. So it starts usually there. They go in, uh, it's on the water. So if we need to do a sea trial or, you know, some way for them to see how the boat runs with it being a deep V step bottom boat and be able to see that offshore performance. We start there, we figure out what model they want. Then they give a deposit, we sign a contract and we figure out what are the options? How do you use the boat? We don't have packages. We don't have, you can get the fishing package or you can get, you know, the, the diving package. We ask you, how do you use your boat? And we cherry pick the things that are important to you without having to stick a bunch of stuff in the boat that you may not use. So it's really tailored to you, even right down to the color selections, the material selections, how the material is sewn, whether it's top stitch or roll and pleat. Uh, we really zero in ex- to make it exactly what you're looking to have for your own boat. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I've heard you say something like uh, geometry. I don't let geometry dictate my creativity. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that's the the mindset of a naive young boat builder who would come up with these really neat, intricate designs for parts. And I would have toolers, people who make the plugs and molds and engineers that would tell me when I'd say, hey, can we recess the switch panel on the side for the battery switches? And they'd say, no, you can't do that. It creates a lock and you won't be able to get the part out of the mold. Or I'd say, can we do a style line on the side of the console? So that way it's, you know, it's not this big flat blank wall that you're looking at. And they would say, no, you can't do that. It, It becomes a lock. So it just got to a point where I'm not really good when, at people telling me not to do things. <laughs> and so I just got to a point where I said, you know what? We're going to build the plug in the mold the way that I want to do it with the designs that I want. And we'll figure out how to get the part out of the mold. So eventually what it turned into was we had to figure out ways to split the mold so where you could pull one side of the mold off and pull the other side and pull the top off. So you pull all these sections of the molds apart to get that part out, which creates a lot of labor. So it's a lot of labor to not only build the part that way, then when you get the part out of the mold, even though it's one solid piece, you have to refinish the entire part. So it kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about not having a dealership network and having the luxury of being able to spend those dollars that a dealer would normally make in the boat, you know, and and being able to build these intricate parts that have a lot of shape and a lot of style that really break all the rules to tooling. That's awesome. Now, 
another thing that happens in your process is you guys actually build an, an a full scale model of the boat that you can actually walk through that you can actually you can actually step into why is that important uh how did you come about doing that well we do that when we tool new models and mm-hmm. the reason for that is you know i i think when you, you watch a lot of other manufacturers out there, what they do is they draw everything out. Everybody gives it a thumbs up. Everybody gives it their approval. And then it goes to some place where they usually, in the, at this day and age, cut everything on a five access mill. So they're cutting, whether it's the plugs or the molds, and then all these molds to create what they drew show up back at the factory and you build all of the parts and you put this boat together. Well, if I had a dollar for every time that we drew everything, that I gave it a thumbs up that I thought was awesome, and then when we mocked it up was not the case, I could have retired a long time ago because when we draw this, it you know it takes probably 50 renditions to get to where you want to, to, to be, but once again, it's just on paper. So you'll get everything mocked up, and you know I'll go up there and I'll sit down in it, and I'll go this is terrible. You know, everybody looks at me and goes, yeah, but you approved the drawing and you said to go ahead and build it. And I go, no, I know. And everybody did exactly what we were supposed to do, but I know it looked great on a piece of paper, but this is uncomfortable or I, I can't see over the gunnel or, you know, there's all these different aspects that come into play when you actually get to sit on it. And when, if you're a manufacturer that, that draws everything and then just sends it to a, 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 tooling shop to have everything cut when you get it back you're stuck with it you know you you've already you're fully vested in this tooling project whereas we're not you know and we'll change things a hundred times going throughout because every little time you tweak something or change something it affects something else but i think that really brings us back to not having to settle you know and, and making sure that it's the best that it can be when it leaves our factory Absolutely. Now, one other thing is that you and I are, are, are pretty lucky individuals in that we're in, indus- we're in an industry that, that thrived during COVID-19. We gained thousands of new boaters uh, in the midst of the crisis. But I remember back in March and April, things weren't, we didn't know what was going to happen, that, that this was going to happen. What were you thinking when the crisis first started coming out? What were you thinking during the shutdowns and, and how did you and your company initially react to it? Well, I'll tell you in March and April, I sold nearly zero, Mm -hmm. which never happens. You know, luckily we have a healthy backlog, but you know, when this whole thing first hit, looking back on it at the time, we didn't know if the world was going to end. I mean, it was it was literally like, you know, what in the world's going to happen? So when March came, you know, I, I had left Miami Boat Show in February, and I think I did like $12 million in sales at the Miami Boat Show, which was fantastic. So I go from that in February to zero in March, which never happens. And then February, I mean, uh, April comes, zero again. And at this point, you know, I'm pulling back on the reins. I'm making sure that I slow production down. I want to make sure that I don't eat up our backlog. I need to protect the the company as a whole. And then all of a sudden, May comes, and I have a record May. And then I have a record June. So as fast as I was hitting the brakes, I had to then jump on the accelerator and try to get things going again. You know, and we never shut down. So, you know, it was, I watched a lot of the places shut down and, and, you know, we, we had decided as a team that we were going to work through this. We were going to work safe. We were going to take care of each other and, and make sure that we kept moving forward because unlike other manufacturers that have dealers with inventory and in most cases are building boats for dealers, it's not a, a make or break situation. That's not the case for us. We have contracts with customers with due dates and people that are expecting their boats. Understandably, you know, there's some a little bit of flexibility considering that we were going into a pandemic that nobody expected. But these are people that we had promised that they would get a boat within a certain time period. And we were going to stick to that and we were going to push through, you know, and we were one of the few companies that actually worked the entire time through it 
And, uh, you know, looking back on it, there's no regrets. And we're really happy that was the, the choice that we made. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it was crazy to see what the difference was between March and May. Because like, May, all of a sudden, you start hearing things. I mean, over here at Fortress Anchors, we started getting tons and tons of orders, trying to keep up with demand. And it went literally from death knell to we need these these your product right now. And, and I can't imagine how crazy it got for you guys. Um, what do you think the keys are to ensuring that all these new boaters we gained in 2020 stay boating in 2021? What's going to keep them on the water? I think that it starts with making sure that we all take care of them. You know, you have to make sure that customer service is number one. You know, when you go to use your boat, you want to make sure that you are just going out to have a good time. Most of the people that can afford our type of boats are busy people, very busy people. So when they get windows of opportunity to use their boat, they want to use it. They don't want any grief. They don't want it to not run. They don't want it to have any issues. So it's important that you Find a way to keep everybody happy because when they get the opportunity to use their boat and they get that window and they take it and they use it, they love it. And that's when they realize how important boating is to their life, to their family, to their sanity during these crazy times. And that's how you keep them. But you keep them by by allowing them to continue to enjoy boating the way that we do. Absolutely. And, and what's your advice to these new boaters as, as they're getting out to the water the, for uh, their first couple of seasons? I think the biggest thing is just make sure you have fun. Be safe. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, always make sure safety is number one because nothing can screw up a good time it, it, faster than somebody getting hurt or or somebody being careless. If you're very new to boating, make sure you take some boating courses. Make sure you go out with some friends that have had boats a while you know, with us, you know, if you, I've had many customers buy a, a boat for the first time from us and we put a captain with them. We'll put a captain with them. We make sure that we not only sea trial them and teach them how to use the boat. We'll call them back a week or two later and go, Hey, how are you doing? You know, do you want the captain to come out and, you know, spend another day with you? And because that's what makes it fun when you can get to the point where you can enjoy yourself and you can relax a little bit and understand all the systems, and understand how the electronics work. You know, I can't speak for anyone else, but I know that when I buy a new car, you know, the dealer's trying to explain everything to me in the parking lot, and I'm like, just get out of my car. Just let me go. You know, I, let me go Let me go use this. You know, and a couple of weeks goes by, and half the things he was trying to tell you in the first place that you weren't really paying attention to, you're going, so how in the world does this work, and how do I turn this on? So, you know, knowing that is – how I am, you know, we make sure that we do the same thing with our customers and we reach out again and give them an opportunity to, to, you know, freshen up on some of the things that we spoke about. And then they've had enough time to actually use the boat and they have questions. So it's important to make sure everybody's comfortable. What's getting you excited for the future of boating and, and, uh, what innovations are you trying to set for 2021? I like doing things first. You know, I, I like that. That's the biggest kick for me. You know, back when we did the first dive door, and we did 35 inch shafts before anybody else did. You know, we built the first quad Yamaha control before Yamaha would do it. You know, I could go on and on of all the things that we've done before everybody else. And and that's what that's what drives me, you know, because a lot of the times, too, when you come out with something new, the industry follows suit and they will do their version of what you just came out with. And that's what pushes me to make sure that when they're, you know, copying the last thing that we did, that we're coming out with this thing, you know, and and making sure that when customers get on my boat at a boat show, I want to hear, do you see what they did now? Can you believe what they did this time? You know, it's, it's continuing to make sure that, that we blow people's minds. And, and be able to go in places and in areas where others haven't and to be able to take it to that next level. You know, the last thing that we did um, was, you know, I, I had customers that were asking us for step boxes. And I was like, why did we, all of a sudden are we getting requests for step boxes? Well, maybe the wife's a little bit shorter or maybe one of the kids runs the boat sometimes and they want to have a good visibility. So, you know, you make this step box, you figure out a way to, you know, 
secure it properly and safely to the cockpit sole. Uh, but then you need to be able to remove it quickly and you got to have a place to store it in case dad wants to drive now and he doesn't want the step box there. You know, and, and you hear this and you get three or four requests for this and you go, you know what, there's got to be a better way. You know, I got with the team and I said, you know what, I want to do something where we just take the sole of the boat just behind the helm and we're going to make it lift four to five inches. You're going to push a button and it's going to raise up. It's going to give them the visibility they want at the push of a button. And then when somebody taller comes along, pushes the button and it goes away. It's those kind of innovations that I love, you know, making sure that, you know, not only does it make it more fun and more comfortable for the person running the boat, for our boaters, it's, it's innovation. It's, it's something that nobody else is doing that we did. And, and having that back pressure really is what drives us to create new products. That's amazing. Now, in an environment like this with your employees, they're, they're, they're obviously proficient technicians, but in a lot of ways, they're also artisans, right? They're, they're, they're building a craft and, you know, you need talent for this. How, how do you find such amazing talent and how do you keep it on board? Well, it, there's a saying that says you're only as good as the people that are around you. And that's true. You know, I'm blessed with the, the most amazing craftspeople and, and management team and engineering team that you could ever imagine. And when we built the, the office that I'm in right now, you know, we were in a literally what looked like a double wide trailer for 18 years. And uh, I, I ended up building this building in 2015. And one of the most important rooms in that building was my classroom. You know, I literally have a classroom upstairs that holds 25 people, which now I have to shrink those group sizes because of social distancing. Uh, but it's some place that we're able to take people and teach them the craft. You know, we have generations of people that work here. You know, I've been here in March, it'll be my 30th year. And I've got people that have worked with me the entire time that the, you know, the same amount of uh, years that I've been here. So being able to have that kind of group with that kind of experience be able to teach the next group, you know, you have to make sure that you show them there's a future in it. You show them that there's good money in it. You know, a lot of them are even children of people that have worked here for 25, 30 years who've seen their parents have a, a beautiful home and new cars. And, you know, they see that this is something that they can do long term. And there's nothing better than doing it for a company that is the best. You know, and that's that's what we press is, you know, we are the best at what we do. And don't you want to be a part of of a team of a family that's the best? And they do. You know, they they have a lot of pride. They love what they do. And they're always up to the challenge. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so you. I know you guys have a couple of new boats that are either in introduction or, or being introduced right now. You have the 409 Valor, the 438 Evolution. Um, what else do you guys have in store for 2021? Do you want to tell the audience a little bit about those two models? And, and uh, then we'll get into how people can get their own, their own Intrepids. Sure. The 409 Valor was a boat that we were going to debut at the Palm Beach Boat Show, which got canceled because of the pandemic. So this is really going to be the first boat show that it goes to. Uh, it's a it's a 40 foot boat that has uh, an aft berth in the cabin. It's got a settee forward with a high low table that creates another queen berth forward, full galley, separate head and shower, um, set up with a lot of forward seating out in the cockpit as well. So that way the helmsman can be a part of the conversation by being able to look forward and talk to those people. Uh, it's a triple application or twin application. Most of them are triples. And uh, shortly thereafter, we did the 438 Evolution, which is from our Sport Yacht Series. You know, so that's a boat that is one size down from our 477 Evolution. So our 477 is a two stateroom boat, whereas the 438 Evolution is a single stateroom boat with a full conversion settee as well large galley, fridge freezer, uh, large separate head and shower. So, you know, the biggest thing for us is being able to have a good size cabin that you can overnight in, 
to have a lot of cockpit seating because look, most of the time when you're on a boat, you want to be outside. So we give lots of coverage, yet we give you the opportunity to be able to sit outside uh, we have big, large bait wells in the back corners with windows in them so you can hardcore fish. If you want to do tuna tubes or sea chests with pressurized systems, you know, we'll rig it as far as you want to rig it. And what we've found is most of our customers want a boat that's very ambidextrous. They want a boat that they can go fish hard with the boys on Saturday, even if they want to go pro fish it for a tournament. And then on Sunday, if the wife wants to go out to the sandbar and hang out or go to a restaurant, it's both. So that's really what we've done uh, with those models. Very cool. Very cool. And how can people get in touch with you if they want to get their own Intrepid? Sure. There's a couple different ways. You can go to our website, which is uh, intrepidpowerboats.com, which will give you all the information that you need with all the models. You can do build a boat, and actually assemble the boat and send in your assembled boat to us for us to be able to spec a price for you. Or uh, you can reach out directly to our sales team at our sales office in Dania at 954-922-7544 and be able to reach out to them. And you'll talk directly to one of our sales team and uh, we'll bring you into the Intrepid family, part of the Intrepid Nation. Awesome, Ken. Well, number one, I just want to acknowledge you. Uh, I mean, it's it, it, anytime anybody can innovate to the degree that you guys have been able to innovate, that's an absolutely amazing thing. You're not just working in an industry, you're actually creating industry. And I think that's awesome. Um, and, and beyond that, it's great for the country. Um, you know, there was times when people thought Amer American manufacturing was dead, but here in the boating industry, people like you are keeping it alive and well. So thank you very much for the work you're doing. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. We're just a bunch of crazy boat builders that like to go over the top. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming on here. And to the audience, definitely check this stuff out. De definitely uh, head over to Intrepid's website. Check these boats out. They are absolutely gorgeous. You see one of these things on, on the water, you can tell it from a mile away. The aesthetics are just beautiful. And, uh, you know, you, you're doing great work, Ken. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. Awesome, guys. To everybody out there, thank you so much for listening to this episode of American Made Boating. We'll be back at you next week with some more awesome count content. Get out there and have fun. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Mr. Ken Clinton, president of Intrepid Power Boats. I know I was absolutely fascinated by the conversation, and I am always fascinated by the boats he produces. Listen, guys, um, we are four episodes deep in American-made boating, and I hope you guys are enjoying what we've got going on so far. I got to ask you all for a favor. Number one, if you can, if you're listening on iTunes, uh, please head over and write a review for the show. It helps so much to spread word about the show. It helps so much to let people know about what we're doing here. And it helps to get the word out to other guests that this is a place where they want to come on and be interviewed. So the more you guys do this for us, the more we're going to be able to get better interviews for you over here to get you great guests and get you awesome content that you're going to be able to listen to each week. Uh, my goal here is to help you out. To, to get you the knowledge, the insights, and the inspiration that you need to keep boating through the long haul. So anything that you want me to cover, any new guests you want me to put on here, please reach out to us at info at fortressanchors.com and we're always happy to take suggestions. And we're starting up some social media here. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can hit us up at Fortress Marine Anchors USA on Instagram or at Fortress Anchors on Twitter. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. We're going to be back at you next week with another awesome interview. We're bringing Captain Jack on from the Two Conks Charters out there in Marathon, Florida, in the Florida Keys to talk about fishing and what you should know before heading out in the water and trying to catch your own limit. This is Chris Albert with American Made Boating coming to you from Fortress Anchors World Headquarters here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I'll talk to you.